Hi, welcome everybody um, to this uh, panel. Um, my name is Quentin Williams. I'm zooming in from all the way from Cape Town. Welcome you all over the globe um, to this uh, phenomenal event uh, of not only our book, uh, Lawns uh, Never Again, but also um, introducing and welcoming um, a group of hip hop artists that have worked um, in the, the South African hip hop scene for, for decades. Um, this extraordinary panel um, uh, seeks to, to invite you to think with us and um, through issues of, of, of hip hop, uh, education, art and activism in South Africa. Um, and to also explore with us issues of education, language, racial identity politics and other global issues that, that affects the hip hop culture within the Cape Town scene. My name is Quentin Williams. I'm one part of four editors um, who have edited this beautiful book, um, Never Again. Today um, joining us um, is Sami Alim, H. Sami Alim, um, full professor at University of California, Los Angeles. Um, also Emil YX question mark, um, hip hop pioneer of South African hip hop, editor of Never Again and Adam Haupt, uh, full professor at the University of Cape Town, the fourth editor of the book. But we are also uh, very honored to be uh, raised by the presence of a B-boy Kurt Munnar um, from Dream Education, um, Rap Muse, um, MC, um, Eavesdrop, and lyrical genius poet, Black Pearl. Um, we hope that you enjoy um, this panel and this engagement, and please uh, send us questions, um, ideas and engagements um, post-panel. Um, I'll now hand it over to A. Samuel Lim to get us uh, going. Thanks, Quentin. Again, welcome everybody to the book launch for Never Again, Hip Hop Art, Activism and Education in Post-Apartheid South Africa. We'll put the post in quotes for this conversation. So I want to I want to get started because I'm I'm honored to be here, obviously, with the team of editors and the brilliant team of artists and everybody in the Cape Town community who's put in serious work to make this uh, event happen and and this culture alive and thriving. So I'm honored first and foremost. But I want to get right to the question for those of you who are tuning in to Trinity Hip Hop Festival around the globe. Uh, a lot of folks don't really understand the Cape Town context and Cape Town hip hop, the hip hop community, the work that you all produce grows out of a particular context. So if you could just take a few minutes and uh, give a sense of how you would describe the Cape Town hip hop community or what's special, what characterizes Cape Town hip hop or Cape hip hop, give our global viewers a sense of that. I would say um, for me, what's, what's uniquely Cape hip hop is the fact that have a very particular history of hip hop Cape Town. Um, you know, we have many of the years of South Africa's hip hop scene who come from the ghettos of Cape Town. Um, you know, and so for us, we, we really have, I think, a wealth of knowledge and information, but also examples of people who came before paved the way for us. So for me, Cape Town hip hop is very almost sentimental when I think of, when I think about the history of Cape Town hip-hop in particular but also what 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 sort of signifies Cape Town hip-hop and South African hip-hop for me is um, the fact that you know it's people express in various different languages and I also find that you know where hip-hop is most alive is in spaces where there's a lot of struggle and that might be a global thing that might be a universal thing but for me because this is my context Cape Town South Africa that's for me what really marks, um, you know, Cape Town hip hop or South African hip hop. Yeah. So for me, like the, you know, as 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 time goes on, the um, the the influence of Cape Town's hip hop uh, changes, you know, and my connection to it is, you know, like when we started out, it was all about like your skill and like what what you can represent, and the, and then the more you learn, the more you realize that um, it's, it's it's not really new. You know, and where I am at the moment, it's um, like this whole idea of reconnect the string 
is about like where it's originally from, you know? Um, this culture is much deeper and much older than we've realized. And so like, as I've, as I've grown older, like it's, yeah, of course, like the skill and the elements, the five core elements and everything else connected to that is, is, is important, but they are connected to everything. You know, and so like Cape Town is a, a, a port city and essentially connected to everything as well. And I didn't realize that. And you know, as with time goes by, I realized that we bring all of our, our, our connection to our ancestry globally, to our local context in Cape Town of First Nation heritage that we didn't even realize, you know. And so for me, Cape Town is a perfect place for, um, for where hip hop like took root. And, and, and why it took root is because of that deep connection to our ancestry, like all of the elements, the circle, the fire, the b-boy, trans dancer, the rock art, graffiti artist, MC, the griot, uh, storyteller, you know, all of the elements are well represented in our ancestry. And so for me right now, uh, it makes so much more sense. And then also connected to our ancestry, like right now, um, is this, um, this illusion of like, um, of, of hunter-gatherer. In actual fact, it's the reverse, is gatherer-hunter, because 75% of the food was gathered by the women and the children, and the hunter was only able to get 25% of the food. And so like for us to, to really go back to our, our true essence, we need to reverse that. We need to, um, you know, the, the men need to connect to the feminine side much more <laughs> and realize the core of, of, of who we are and the rethinking of our of our value system, especially at this time, because e essentially um, the the scarcity model is destroying the planet. You know, like the the idea of like never having enough comes from a Western thinking, whereas in our ancestry we always had abundance, we always had enough. You know, so our thinking is our creativity is actually more than enough. And so to reverse that thinking, I think that Cape Town is a perfect place um, to set that foundation if we allow it to obviously, uh, for us to start thinking differently about, about who we are as a hip hop community um, based on our heritage. And, and I mean, when I say our, I mean like in, in, essence, in, in essence, Cape Town is all of the world's heritage. Like if you do a DNA test, you will find out that you're you are from everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a perfect spot for us to actually, you know, re-examine that uh, that history. So, so, like Pearl, how do you how do you connect what Emil is saying about the sort of ancestral foundations of hip hop culture and what Eavesdrop is talking about the current contemporary struggle in Cape Town? How do you connect those two in terms of what defines hip hop in Cape Town? What gives it its special flavor? I think authenticity would be the word that I've, I've uh, decided to, to um, explain this to you, um, to use to explain. So authenticity is it's once you know, once you know you are and you found your own identity and you're confident in who you are, you're able to be authentic and embrace that in such a way. For example, um, one thing that's very unique here is the way we speak Afrikaans, you know, and how we find, um, how we're able to express ourselves in that language, you know, that, that's ancient, actually. That's a combination of ancient and different languages. And so when we speak Afrikaans, especially when we rap in Afrikaans, you know, or do poetry in Afrikaans, or Afrikaans otherwise, um, especially pertaining to the Cape in particular, we, we come across very angry men. We sound like the tone, the, the tone and the, um, the attitude that comes with, with the language is very, um, sounds very angry, you know, and, and aggressive. And it's okay because that's just how we speak. It's how we, it's who I am. And people must take me or leave me, but they have to deal with and accept for who I am and where I come from. For me, a, a big deal for me about Cape Town hip hop is it's how we latch on to originality, right? So, uh, uh, there, there are many opportunities or times that come where we say where we maybe have to. Let's change who we are so we can get this buck, so we can go do this. But then we're like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to change who I am if it's going to take that originality away from me. If it makes sense, we stick. We, 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 we really are hardcore when we stick to that because that's who we are. Um, and, and the second thing is the way we, the way we carry hip hop around with us into various spaces, man. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't change when I go into this space or change when I go into that space. 
Um, it's like with me with my teaching. Um, I was very unhappy in my class for a bit, but uh, I realized, yeah, I'm doing other people here, man. I'm being okay here with being trying to be like other people, and then I realized, okay, I'm gonna be myself now. I'm gonna bring myself to this party, and we carry that with us, and that allows us to change the space that we in and change the atmosphere. Um, and and I I genuinely believe it. I see it all over, and there's nuggets of that all over Cape Town. Do you know what I mean? If you go to a skate park or wherever, you're going to see the Owens. They're doing the thing. They're going to be rapping, dancing, spraying, and they've got that unique vibe with them wherever they wherever they go. And we're quick to pick up when you when you're not real, when you're not really holding that up. When we see it, the the brass fake, the brass not. You know what I mean? And and we pick that up. We might not speak or say it, but this conversation and some of us might go, yo, but you're not real, man. You we can see there's a facade here. Um, and yeah, I think that that's one of the things I would latch onto. Um, and I genuinely think that if you look at Cape Town, you see hip hop with the graffiti. You just see the presence of it physically in the spaces. If you look at Woodstock, if you go to Mitchell's Plain, you see it. Where you go to other parts of the country, I don't think it's that prominent. Um, so yeah, you will feel it in terms of our spirit and who we are. But at the same time, you're gonna see it. You're gonna see it. Um, Materialize, you'll see it with your own eyes wherever you go. You'll know Cape Town is hip hop. And like Emil is one of the guys that they he started uh, um, Battle of the Year. That that made me come alive. When I went to that comp, I was like, whoa, does this thing exist, my bro? This changed. I remember standing there, like, what's going on? And I think that's what you find here. You're going to bump into it sometime. And if it gets hold of you, it changes everything. Yeah. On that note, um, just quickly for context, um, for people who don't know, Kurt is a, a school teacher and he uses hip hop as a tool right, to, 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 to get people, young people to understand mathematical concepts. And he does write about his work as an educator using performance, using creativity, using music. Uh, elements of music and, and, and dance movement involving the body in the process of learning. He writes about it in his, in, 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 in his chapter in Never Again. So starting with Kurt, could you maybe tell us a little bit about the chapter that you wrote for the book and did it give you the opportunity to uh, reflect upon how one uses hip hop as a tool for, for education, for engagement, for social change? So uh, the chapter was Genuinely, gen genuinely and genuinely about my lived experience. You know, it was, I'm living this, like I was saying earlier, I'm living in these two worlds. Um, on the one side, I'm a dancer and I'm, we, we, we performing and people are losing their minds and, and we connecting with people, even people just watching, they engage and they hook and they lock in. And in that sense, they are participating. On the other side, I'm coming to school teaching and the kids are looking at me with blank stares, like, what is going on here? Uh, you know what I mean? It's just these two different worlds. And then on the one side, I'm, I'm at practice first. We're putting in hours to get two minutes of dancing, right? And on the other side, I don't smart to sit and plan my lessons maybe or do what I have to do in terms of what the curriculum or, or the department says I have to do to execute. And, you know, for a full day or a lifetime of teaching. So uh, the chapter is about bringing those two together, but also not just that, about realizing that the school and my space needed hip hop, right? That's why I speak about hip hop never saved my life necessarily, but it changed, it genuinely changed my life because I was teaching like other teachers. But the moment I started being, I'm gonna be myself and I'm gonna bring my flavor to the class. I'm gonna dress the way I wanna dress. Um, and, and I'm gonna challenge those, those spaces that I remember, um, I didn't put this in the chapter, but I, I was cool in often to, be, to address me, but how I was dressing. Because I would wear a suit and tie, but then I'd rock my veil. You know that FUBU tracksuit, that baggy suede tracksuit? I would rock that. And then they would call me two days after Kurt, change your outfit. Then I'd say, cool. Then I'd, two days later, I would come back again with it. And it was this constant back and forth. But I had to be who I was. Because if I'm not myself, the learners pick it up. And that energy stays in the class. Um, so uh, it speaks about how I brought this together. And I think every teacher should do this. Um, and then the other thing was hip hop just pulls the kids in because we have to, re like, I don't know who said, we have to reach them before we teach them, right? And hip hop is about our lived experiences. You know, if you listen to MCs, 
It's about the lived experience. They're bringing the realness. So I had to bring that realness into the classroom and the kids could go, yo, this guy's real. Um, I would spend time with him because no, hip hop is about collaborating. Hip hop is about sitting down with people. It's about having conversation. So I didn't spend so much time in staff rooms anymore. I'd be outside break with the kids, chilling, talking, right? Um, and then when it came to the music side of things was obviously, so I'm a dancer, but I understand that music pulls people, right? Hip hop music has got this vibe. Went to studio, recorded. I'm, I'm not the MC guys, but I was like, I can't afford to pay an MC now to come and do this. It's just, no. I promise you guys, um, the kids sat for a minute and they were like, what the flip is going on here? Is this happening? And then off afterwards, the kids were vibing. And we speak about, you know, learner-centered. Hip hop is all about centering everybody. You know what I mean? It's about centering us. It's about the democracy. It's not about me standing here telling you. And that's what it allowed me to do. And the beauty of it is it allowed a special discourse, a special conversation amongst us. And we could listen and we could talk. And here we speak with, you know, Paulo Freire. You know, if we, don't, if we can't have a conversation, then there's no love, man. Then I don't respect you. Um, and then after that, I started messing with dance. I was like, okay, now how do we mix maths with dance? So we can use dance just as dance in the class, which is very important, especially if we like with find ourselves in COVID-19, right? Mental health, we need to exercise, we need to free ourselves up and be like, but then also just around hip hop pushed me to think more critically about my pedagogy. And you find a lot of people that just, they just remain where they are. But now it goes, how do you teach this concept using hip hop? And I'm still in that space at the moment. It's pushing me till today. And what I want to do is segue to Mo and Janine, because what they do is they, they're not necessarily in a formal school setting. They operate in other spaces and they use poetry and emceeing and theater to engage young people. And they both have histories um, with this and of course there are challenges there are ups and downs and, and difficulties so perhaps janine can you perhaps tell us about black pole foundation and the work that you do with poetry with theater and and workshopping and and, and so on um and of course you know you do reflect about the, this in, in in your book chapter and it starts with the story of, of of your brother who was an educator and performer and activist and how you took your cue from him to to build this amazing project that you have running right now. Over to you. Yes, for sure. Thanks so much uh, for the platform. Um, so the Black Pole Foundation uh, came quite a long way. Um, it's a new entity, but it's, it's, it takes in all the work that I've been doing my whole life um, within development in our communities, working with young people, um, especially youth at risk. And I started doing that while I was studying at university. Um, I was about, yeah, just after 18. And I volunteered at the local organization in Mitchell's Plain. And um, I knew right away, this is what I love doing, you know? But obviously this background, this influence, you know, um, these people who inspired me to, to, to go out and try this out because I had quite a passion, I still do, for people. And, just helping people, connecting with people, giving people a voice, um, giving people space to find their own voice. And being that young and going into that kind of work, you know, was really good for me in terms of um, finding myself or, or adding to who I already knew I was. So what we do as a foundation is we work with um, young people and adults in our communities um, in Cape Town, mostly in Mitchell's Plain where I'm from. and like, like I say in the book, I can't speak much about my story without uh, speaking about my late brother, Devious, that many people know, because he was such a large influence um, growing up together. And so hip hop, when I first heard about hip hop, it was through him, you know, through his lens and through his ears and through his mouth rather. And everything I knew about hip hop was what I learned from my, my older brother. And so automatically I latched on to the music. I loved every aspect of it. I started out rapping. Um, and well, I started out 
writing poetry, but just writing to express myself when I was about 11, 12 years old. I then went into rapping, you know, writing rhymes and jamming with him, you know, in the house. And then as I grew up, few years later, I was like, no, man, I think I'm more of a singer. <laughs> you know? um, and I would, I would embrace that. And I started singing and writing music. But the funny thing is when I went onto stages to perform, people um, at open mic stages, et cetera, et cetera, people would, MCs would come up to me and they would look at me and they say, you sing, but your, your lyric sounds like, you, like you're an MC, like you're rapping, but you're singing, you know, in melodies. And I would laugh because I know where that came from, you know. So um, just that as some background. But I've always, and, and just putting what I know, my music, my passion for music and creating um, within the arts and being very compassionate towards people and helping people develop and find themselves. Um, I put that all together, you know, um, and through the foundation still now, we run programs, various programs, and our programs always come from the point of what the need is in the community. You know, just earlier this week, um, someone was speaking to me in our, in our office and saying to me, there's just something so different about your organization, about what you do. And I smiled, I grinned, grin, and I said, because we go the extra mile, you know? It's not just about being an organization and um, getting funding and running programs. It's really about what the people need. And if the need is multimedia and film um, training, we create that. We partner with the necessary people. We put everything together that we need in place. We create that. If the need is um, music, dance, theater training, because young people want to um, develop that within themselves, that's what we create and we, we make it happen for them. Um, if right now one of our programs is a nail technician uh, short learning program that we're offering to mostly women, and there was a big need in our community. Um, people would come up to us, we, we did some research, we find out, yay, Women want to do this, but they can't afford it. It's an extremely expensive course to do. And so we we get our ducks in a row. Um, yeah, that's a long story. <laughs> but um, we make it happen at the end of the day, you know. And right now we've got, we're at our eighth group. Well, we're at our ninth group about to start of women um, in the communities doing this training for free or a very small amount of money that they can afford. And they, they go out here, they feel liberated, they feel confident, they, um, they, they feel they can go out and, and live their dreams, man. Um, not just women, young people, boys and girls. So one other aspect of our organization and our programs is that we always combine life skills with all our programs, everything, because life skills is very crucial. And life skills for me is, it started in my home when I was, you know, a little, little child. And so we, we call it transferring skills. So it's very important for our organization to do what we're confident in doing um, and not just be a talk show and, and do things that we don't feel or, or that we understand ourselves, you know? Um, so that's, that's in a nutshell what we do. <laughs> um, and it, it takes a lot of work because, you know, I think this isn't, might be, um, yeah, I might be jumping the gun here, but one of the challenges that we find is the lack of motivation in our communities, man. You know, um, um, and it's not lack of motivation. I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people lack motivation just to go out there and do what they want to do or reach reach the goals. You know, they they, they would have, we all have dreams and goals, but to get to take that first step and make it happen, man, I think that's very hard for people because there's layers and layers of 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 pain and self hurt and self hate that people have to work through and. I, I always say, I think we help them break through those things, you know, within themselves um, in terms of a solution to that challenge. So you're already anticipating the next question. What are some of the challenges and how do you imagine one, what can one do with it? And so what I'd like to do is segue to Mo, aka eavesdrop, to address that question, but then also after that, Emil. Mo, you, you know, you, you work on, on hip hop theater, you're an MC you know, 
um, you've worked in a number of recording projects, you've, you've traveled, like, like some of the artists in, in the room, all of the artists in the room, you've traveled extensively, and you've worked in a number of different kinds of projects. And of course, sustainability is, is, is a challenge. How do you sustain yourself as an artist, as someone hoping to do work in the community? What are some of the things that make it difficult? You know, um, Janine's already spoken to some of those issues, but from your perspective, um, can you speak to the, the issue of sustainability in making a life as an artist and activist? And what are the obstacles and how do you negotiate that? Sure, for sure. I think for me, it's this constant need to always diversify myself. So I'm always having to wear many different hats. So outside of that, it's also to squeeze out as many hours in the day and maybe add, create days where there aren't even days just to be able to have enough time to do all the various things that one has to do to be able to sustain. So for an example, at the moment, I'm working a nine to five job, um, six days a week, pretty much. And after hours is spent up until early hours of the following day, just sort of catching up on Apple creative projects, working on research, putting together proposals, et cetera, et cetera. Even just having time to dream. So I think what's, what's really stood out for me as an important factor in sustainability for myself as a creative is collaborative work. So really just reaching out to community, reaching out to other artists, reaching out to artists I wouldn't normally collaborate with just because it diversifies our pool of resources then. So there might be something I can offer in exchange for something you know, that person can offer. So I think what's really stood for me or started to stand out even more is the importance of community, you know, a creative community because Collaboration is the only way we're going to be able to sustain ourselves and keep building. And what's important that the work doesn't stop. The face of the work might change, the process might change, you know, what eventually gets produced might be slightly different, but the movement still has to stay. And so it's been really tough as well because when you are a fringe artist, if I can call myself that, you know, not sort of the mainstream so I'm not doing what's easy or palatable or easy to understand so it's really hard to get funding when you are already doing things slightly differently your message is different your medium is different and on top of that you don't have a like a huge track record of receiving a lot of institutional funding so when you apply most of the time your application gets pushed pushed out because you know, various factors. So I found that been really challenging for me is getting recognition from institutions, you know. Um, but I think in terms of understanding the alternative to that is community and collaboration, that started to sort of shine a light within myself. And also it's taught me how important it is that I break out of my shell or my comfort zone and reach out to people whom I never would have needed to or thought of reaching out um you know hadn't there been these kinds of challenges so i like like i always find myself you know living almost two very different lives in one body to be able to you know have a job and contribute to the creative work and then find the energy create the energy to do the creative work <laughs> Yeah, I think you know my um, my chapter on the b-boy is, is is an activist is um, sort of a, a, a how to you know because we think and we do I mean, dances generally we have to take action we don't it's only when you get old like me then you can speak a bit more than you <laughs> than you do and and so the more on, like, if you're thinking something and you're writing you're you're writing something then the and and also if you're in your community they hold you accountable like the first. Like I, I give an example in there where I tell the lightest at the school um, that library over there is filled with lies from Europe. How many of our books is in that library? And the lighty like, yeah, it's a yellow book. Did you already write the book? And I was like, yeah, on point, my bro. You know, and then it drove me to when I told him, yeah, I did. But I put out like a manual or what is hip hop manual that means uh, that I shared with people, right? Which I just photocopied and like means to photocopy throughout the... <laughs> throughout the, the country basically. And so it demanded that I 
go through the process of putting that book out. And then I return to the school and show the lighting. And for me, that is like what the real power of like, and to, to what, what um, Kurt is mentioning about being a teacher, like you have to, you have to show them more than do them. Like the first time that I, I, I uh, when I left teaching, um, I asked the kids my situation. I said, like, if you were faced with like sucking up and doing what other people want you to do and, you know, being like dressing like you don't look and like being who you're not or just for the sake of like getting a paycheck, then we do that versus like following your heart and like not getting paid. They were like, nah, we will rather suck up and do what, you know. And I was shocked. I was like, your standard three light is my bro. They will sacrifice themselves. That's like, why would you do that? And so I decided to to do what I what I what I spoke about. Because if I didn't do it, they'd be like, yo, that was a that was a crap example, you know, like I'm a bad example of a teacher. And so all of my um activities is based on almost like experiential learning, you know. And because of my 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 teaching background, I, like, I didn't even realize it until I got to the US, but like the Bay Area. Uh, through Polski have been influenced to teach workshops because they wrote to me in South Africa. Like this is in 96. Like they never taught, they never did workshops. None of this stuff happened here until he spoke to me. And so the, the scene flourished in the US and the West Coast specifically around teaching B-Boy basics and DJing and Q-Bird. They were all involved in that in the Bay Area. And like I and, and I had no idea that because he wrote to me, they learned like, yo, that you can do workshops and spread the culture on, on, on the ground in this manner. You get what I'm saying? So for me, it's like part of the, the, the problems that we are faced with, you can actually find things flourish from that problem like if you address it and if you, you take action on those, those, those things. Like we don't have access to information. I wrote to people in the US. I don't have access to information. I travel to uh, Zulu Nation anniversary in New York. You know what I mean? And like firsthand, ask Chuck D, what does he think? And ask, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, Africa Bambata and the members of the Zulu Nation. So it's like whenever there's a problem, it's either you look at it as like, ah, damn, you know? And, but then there's the op opportunity that it, that it gives to learn something. And in the process of learning, you learn new way that you have to deal with it because our reality in South Africa or Cape Town specifically is not the same as even Johannesburg, South Africa, because of the economics, you know, so you have to adapt, you have to change it, you have to make it real to your situation. So I think like from the basic idea of like a people you, you break and then you, if you don't put your hat out to get people to donate around that circle, you're not going to get any money. But the lesson is that your performance has value. And you put that hat up to show that you are confident enough to say Keiki. And that, which I find shocking now, like a lot of people is won't jam in the street, won't even ask Keiki, sit the, sit the ot and the kippy. You know what I mean? Which is again, the fault lies on us. Like why, why will we not do that? Why will we not demand that what we create has value? And so from that initial lesson is like, okay, that small circle that happened in the, in the town center or up in, in on the, um, third class section of the train in Cape Town just became the battle of the year. Like how much money do we need to buy that flights? How many tickets do I need to sell? What technique can I use to raise that money? So it's like to learn from the experiences and then also the silent lessons that our parents were doing that already, like leaving tickets with auntie over here to sell. That's the, that's the process I used. I used what I saw to implement like the solutions to those problems, you know, because there, there's a fraud of problems, you know, and the same with, like, with Heal the Wood, we realized like only if we change how we think, like we can do, we can teach all of those elements of hip hop and it's all, all the skills we can teach, but if we don't change our fundamental thinking of who we are and what, and what is our relationship to economics, then we, we, don't, we don't change anything. Sure, I really feel in you, sister. Um, I'm listening to your journey and your experience and I'm just thinking, yo, I've been there um, and I'm still there, but not on the same level. Like I'm a mother, I'm running an organization, I'm still performing full time, you know, in between because I'm not getting paid enough at the organization because we don't have enough funding um, for the position that I'm in. Um, but it's all about building, you know, building the organization building um, our reputation in, as, within the community. Um, and so I need to still perform, <laughs> you know, I'm still performing a lot. And that's where my actual income comes from that pays the bigger bills, <laughs> you know. So I, I really feel you, um, your hustle, and I feel the frustration 
um, because I've been there regarding you having to, to have a nine to five so that you can fund the creative side, you know. And I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for where I am because um, I've, yeah, you know, I've put in so much work and I still do. And it's long hours and it's juggling family and it's, you know, and, and still helping people daily, you know, not even through the programs, but people into our office and they need CVs, they don't have money. Um, artists constantly stop me, you know, stop me, still stop me in the road and come and knock on here. They can't afford um, services and resources like making beats or paying for studios. And I will always tell them, KP man, um, it's important to network and educate yourself. Um, about so so now I've, I've kind of moved away from you, Mo. I'm just like again going to um, what we end up doing. So I always tell tell the fellow artists or up and coming artists, especially, it's important for you to need to can educate yourself in, um, as an artist about financial management and um, that it's important to pay for quality, you know. Um, so when you make money, invest in yourself, pay for that studio fees, you know. So yes, it's always going to be a cost involved. But make sure that you, and this is what I tell artists, make sure that you, you are you willing and ready to pay for that service because that's how we, we keep supporting each other. We're paying another artist who makes beats or produce. Um, and at the end of the day, I get the product out of that and I can make some money off that. So it's quite a good circle, but if only if we understand it and we put in the legwork, you know, um, we also offer mentorship in that sense. Like I say, we constantly get bombarded with ask people coming to ask us for help. One, because they know I'm Black Pearl. Two, they know our organization, the foundation does, um, is here doing work in the community. So there's no kind of stepping back and saying, nah, I was kind of yelping, you know. Um, I always make a way to help and, and, and definitely through my very big network, like Yield the Hood, like, you know, there's so many others, uh, creative, um, there's a studio here in the plane, you know, um, yo, there's so many other entities, um, companies, organizations that um, we tap into because we really don't have all the capacity all the time. So, yes, like Mo, like Mo said, it, it's in any way, it's important to, to work together, to collaborate and just help each other, man. But we also have to understand the levels that we are on because... I can't help if I if, if we're not on the same page, you know. Um, if if that's also important, we have to be on the same page because my help will end up being in vain. You will have, end up coming with um, wasting your own time. So it's very important to know what it is that we want and how we can actually really help each other with the resources, the information, the networks that we have. Thank you. And I just want to say for folks who first encounter hip hop in Cape Town. One of the first things that you notice is the incredible amount of creativity and originality as artists. So in the book, Never Again, it's never again hip hop, art, activism, and education. And so uh, first thing is that it's probably not a coincidence that um, the racial justice movement exploded when Emil came to the US and decided he was going to stay here for a little bit because all hell broke loose as soon as Emil dropped that fire on him, right? Not a coincidence. But you all do all this political activism and this education inside and out of, outside of schools. You do it everywhere you go. You bring it constantly, right? But at the center of it, right, is hip hop culture and the hip hop arts. So when folks encounter Cape Town hip hop, that's the first thing. Minds are blown at the originality, the creativity, the styles, the flavor. You got it from dancing, emceeing, DJing, you know what I'm saying, graph. The style and the art is what's holding all of this together. What I think is like the heart of all of that. So as artists, and whoever wants to take this, can you describe like the importance of the creativity, the creative process, the art to everything that sort of flows from that? Yo, so I've, I've, I spoke about earlier about originality and creativity, uh, it's at the essence of everything because if, if you look at the work I'm doing in teaching and creating materials, I'm sitting and I'm going, how do I teach kids to use a compass how to draw parallel lines, etc. Now I go, how do I do this? I bounce to hip hop. I must be original. And, and this is the thing about hip hop, man. 
and you guys know what dance, you can do the same move over and over as a dance battle. It's going to be crazy first, then they're going to get used to it. Then you have to bring something new to the table, right? You have to bring something new to the table. So that's exactly what I brought to my teaching. It's like, okay, cool. I taught it this way. So how do I teach it now? Now I go, okay, cool. How do I teach that um, concept using graffiti? And then you sit and you figure it out and you battle because I genuinely believe, and I learned this from hip hop, it's two things can come together. You just really have to think about it all the time and you have to do the research. Do you know what I mean? So the creativity, um, it, it's just, I feel like sometimes if I'm just doing the same old same thing, I feel guilty in a sense, do you know, like, ah, oh, how boring is that? Like, I just started a YouTube channel now, we're releasing a video. It doesn't yet quite hit the vision and I can't go on because of the first one. But as time goes, I'm going to go, how do we turn this up? How do we add more creativity and originality to it? And the beauty of this creativity that you find here is the fact that it constantly pushes you to do more research. It constantly pushes you to think more critically about what you are doing and constantly helps you look at things that you don't think might necessarily come together. Do you know what I mean? And that helps you with, with, with life because a lot of times in life, we facing problems. And even now with COVID, whatever, you have to kind of juggle and how do we fix this? How do we tackle this in a, in a different way? But the process, it varies at certain times. Sometimes things can come to you in the middle and I'm sure you all know that like flip, I got this idea and you jump to it. Other times, and I'm sure it's like that when all of you guys write songs or poems, it's something you have to constantly work on. It's something you constantly have to put out there. And how do I fix this? How do I change this? Um, like now, for example, I'm working on, you know, when you teach the number line, when you're teaching kids about the number line. So now what I did is I threw a big number line on the floor. I take certain hip hop dance steps and we move from right to left. So now you get to experience the number line. It's not the small thing on the table in a book, right? So now I go, okay, cool. You started a YouTube channel. How does this look? Okay, cool. Now what we're going to do is we're going to draw a big ass number line. We're going to stand. We're going to take a drone shot from the top and some dope music. Now, that for me is going to look crazy and I hope it gets the vision. But again, it's constantly about the originality and the creativity and pushing this thing. Even if you look at the six step, why don't we just draw a big um, Cartesian plane on the floor? We do the six step. We plot where our feet goes. And that's how we teach kids to plot points. Do you know what I mean? But now it becomes an experience. But without the... And again, I bring it back to, to hip hop. Because there it's about creativity, bro. You have to put it out there. Can't be sell it and yell it, don't you? So <laughs> you can't. So for me, that, that the creativity is of the essence of it. And I think even the birth of hip hop is like, my bro, let's make we, we we create something from nothing. Yeah. What other people would consider nothing, right? That's the that's, when that's the line. Yeah, sorry. When you're in certain spaces, they would look at you and go, "What is this? This is so." That's magic for us. And what, what birth from that next level ideas, my bro? What about the, the MC's sort of creativity or the art of MCing? What's most important about it to you? I think for me, what's most important about it is the ability to step inside of yourself, you know? So I think the spiritual aspect of, of the MC for me is vital. Um, because even growing up, I had exposure to so many different worlds. So you're living, you know, in the flats, you're living in, in the courts, you know, you're seeing washing lines, it's concrete, it's a lot of people living on top of each other. But then you also step out of that and you experience something that's totally different. And so I think I spent a lot of time dreaming, you know, a lot of time cultivating the inner world because I couldn't make a lot of sense of all of the components of the outdoor world. Everything was so juxtaposed and you know, very confusing as well and even I think it created some schism in myself sometimes I felt like I had too many personalities you know and I think only inside myself in the world inside myself was where I found space for for all of that and so I, I developed this third almost world where you know anything that I decided would be created and generated there and that was also where I find I, I sort of sharpen the abilities and my skills. You know, I constantly compete with myself inside of this world as all my personalities were there. So I think the importance of dreaming and the importance of really just tapping into your spirit and who you are. And I think 
our people have a lot of time to reflect, to dream. You know, a lot of time, ask my mom, what, what was your dream for young? What did you envision for your life? What did you think you would come? And she said, I never had a dream. And that was the strangest thing for me to hear because I thought, well, what, how, how did you not have a dream? Like, where would you go when things got tough? You know, how would you, where would you escape to? And so, you know, just thinking that you'd have to constantly fight that battle, which means you could never think, you could never, you could never take time out and debrief, which means that you never had the time to daydream or just dream and be. So I think that for me is, is vital when it comes to the creative process. And, and our people don't have that luxury. It, it, a lot of people see it as a luxury to have ability to reflect. It's do, 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 get it done. Don't take time. Make sure that it's sorted out because if you don't, we're not in today. If you don't, we lose the roof of our head. If you don't, mom's is going to get by pops again tonight. So, you know, it's, it's that aspect for me that is vital in the creative process because that's where I tap into my ancestry. That's where I get to determine my DNA. Who do I come from whom I don't know, who we've never met? What language did we speak? What practices did we have? That all has in the dream world. And so a lot of the right process, a lot of the creative and conceptual process is all divination. It is a moment of, you know, escaping to another realm and finding what you need then coming back. And sometimes you look at it and you're like, what is this? <laughs> Who, whose is this? Um, you know, so you realize it's not necessarily yours, but you've been given responsibility of, of you know, allowing it to pass through. So you, you, the whole sort of spiritual realm for me is vital. Our mm. people to be able to retrace and go back and find what we need. There's this this amazing uh, um, activism that just appears on the pages of the chapters, especially from Emil and um, and Black Pearl but also in the reflections from eavesdrop and, and Kurt's use of logic, mathematics, uh, a pure language and flipping it, remixing it and giving it back as something creative embodied. I think the, what hip hop has achieved in Cape Town and especially with your activism uh, through language, you've taken the hand of the, the lack of will of politicians and pulled it closer to the ideal situation for a lot of uh, black and brown speakers who, who use the language that they speak, the Afrikaans that they speak. And this documentary that you reflect on in, the, in, in your chapter email, but also um, Blackpool, the way that you reflect on, on, the, uh, on not only the, the language use, but its future, um, that has yet to arrive, but it may be soon, it might be here, you never know. My question to you is, is to, to talk about the unthinkable becoming real, talk about the ideal that is, is necessary, talk about the future that will become now. What, what happens or what do you think if this language born out of violence, colonial violence, what if, what if Afrikaans, you know, what it is as, as this marginalized, historically marginalized language, what if it becomes um, a legal language? Yeah, I mean, like the, the, in the production, we say that it, the fact that people speak it already makes it legal, you know, um, the, the, the legality of it is based on law and law in global context is based on land theft. And, and, and so essentially, unless those, that land is returned to the people, <laughs> there is no way that it will legally be implemented. I don't, I, I, you know, I see a lot of what's happening right now as a, as a distraction from um, giving people back the land. You know, we look at where all over the world, First Nation people have been, are, are demanding that they get their land back. And you've suddenly just, it's been silenced, you know. So I, I, I personally believe that all the members of the cast, Afrikaans, are implementing the content of legalizing it on a daily basis. Whether it be Kyle in his music um, that he's making for movies, or you know Pearl in the organization, the Blackpool Foundation, or Hilda would 
uh, project, you know, putting on the production Africa Ups for the kids, where they creating their own skits and their own pieces in the school and speaking, um, speaking caps to the teachers and the teachers accepting that now because the teachers realize the lighty that didn't speak before just didn't have the freedom because they stopped them from speaking the, the, the way they're comfortable. And so the, the thinking is already bubbling under, you know, and, and, and I, I feel like it takes, you know, you, 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 you want to change the world with what, and I, I, I remember this, this occasion outside of um, the Baxter where um, everybody was like, yo, the change, people laughing, the change is happening. I was like, yo, we answered the Baxter UCT, Fokul gaat change, die mensen gaat die was Fokul terug in die, and Paul him on, yeah, Emil, you're always going to be so a Debbie Downer, my brother. The whole course were like, I was like, nah, I where we are, you see. You know, and like, look at it now, like the, the mechanism that makes billions of language in South Africa, you know, the 24-7, um, media 24-7 theft of the, of the language of the people in Cape Town, <laughs> that body made millions, their own shares in Facebook, they're not going to, they're going to give that up without a fight. So I feel like in order for you to, to, to change that, slow changes and really D statement about like it is what it is, but at the same time, you working, you know what you can do. You know where you can infiltrate young minds and change the thinking. And actually the truth is you can only supply the information. They ultimately have to internalize that information to bring about the change. And as a teacher, Sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. We think, yo, I'm going to change the world. Nah, you can only supply the information. That's the only power you have is over yourself. The only change you can bring about is yourself. Everything else is information you're putting out and you hope that people will internalize that. So, yeah. That's well, clearly legal, my brother. <laughs> well, yeah. Part, yeah, go, Sammy. Part of what you always, uh, a, a wise man once said, because that's very revolutionary, right? But you're being... I mean, you as a wise man have always said that the greatest revolution is internal. And that's one of the most beautiful things about hip hop, right? The defiant giants from back in the day here talked about hip hop as a light giving sun, that the rays of the sun come affect the mind, create changes and chemical changes in your mind so that new thoughts and actions are possible. And I know that's what's behind Heal the Hood Foundation, Black Pearl Foundation, all the work Kurt and eavesdrop to. I mean, that's what's behind it, right? We believe in the power of words to impact us like the light of the sun, causing revolution and change in our minds, right? I mean, it's a beautiful thing and it's a beautiful thing to witness. So I just wanna thank all of you, all of the artists, uh, every single one of you, eavesdrop, Emil, Kurt, Black Pearl, um, Adam, Quentin, um, everybody just for doing your thing for keeping it consistent, keeping everybody in check and working hard and making beautiful music and art along the way that impacts um, not just how we think, but also how we act and how we be in the world. So thank you for that.